So uh, it is the new year on the lunar calendar that's used by the Vietnamese. <clears throat> And I read in the newspaper this morning, which was yesterday's paper, I'm always a day behind, um, that in Thailand, the new year is in April, I think. And I know in Sri Lanka, it's in a different time. And of course, I asked a Jewish friend of mine some years ago, we were involved in an ecumenical group, and in total ignorance, you know, it's, it's so interesting how we can say things that we think are very innocent and innocuous, and we can offend someone because, uh, you know, we're, we're an extremely egocentric animal. We are convinced that everything that we believe is what everybody else should believe, and that the way we see the world is the way everybody else should see the world. And if they don't see it that way, then they have a serious problem. And so I turned to my friend Vern, and I said, so when is the Jewish New Year? Now, that sounds pretty innocent, doesn't it? Except if you belong to a religion that believes that their New Year is the only New Year that exists <laughs> in the universe. And he got pretty huffy with me. And we used to go, at least once a month, we would go out to lunch together. He was very proud. There's a Chinese restaurant in Victorville on 7th Street, which is closed now, I believe. But he was very proud because he had his own set of chopsticks there. So we would go there every other time so he could ask for his set of chopsticks. And it made me, it really made me wake up to the idea that uh, uh, the assumption that someone has the same view. Because I, I was aware of the fact, I, I talked to a Vietnamese monk that actually told me that he cried on the New Year's uh, in, for Vietnam, which was, the 28th was the New Year. The 27th was New Year's Eve. And uh, so yesterday, Saturday was the New Year's, and I had a couple visitors here that brought uh, some stuff. And he told me he cried. He was, in, he was in Sri Lanka, and they didn't celebrate the New Year's when he did. And he got very homesick because it wasn't the same. So I can tell you with a fair amount of confidence that the Chinese and the Vietnamese celebrate the same New Year's, and that's about it, because I know that they do. So I went down, uh, and my monks, and we went down to a temple in Ontario, a Vietnamese temple, that my friend has. In the last couple of years, he's asked me to speak. When he comes here, uh, I have, uh, I hope you folks can come when we have one of these occasions, usually in the warm weather. <laughs> but uh, what we do is uh, the last few years, I don't know how many years it's been, I, I split it because we'll have lots and lots of Vietnamese people here, a couple hundred Vietnamese people. And, and uh, I have a wonderful lady who organizes the kitchen, and it's all Vietnamese food, and so if you haven't had any, it's all vegetarian, of course. And so you come and you have this wonderful meal that uh, is, is made. And I, in, we, I invite a number of monks, and this is a pretty common practice, because it's considered really good luck. I guess that's the simplest way to say it, to have lots of monks and nuns. So I invite uh, three or four or five or six of these, and we give them a gift of money because, um, you know, I, I know I look like I have a high salary here, but uh, I, I joke about last year the board approved uh, double my salary, which means I now make nothing. <laughs> so, uh, so we give them a little gift of money so that they can take care of themselves. And... <clears throat> We, the chanting we did today was in English, and when people call, I always tell them, and I tell the Vietnamese, I say, all our chanting here is in English. And many of the chants that we did, the stuff we did this morning, all of that started off in Vietnamese and was translated into English. And uh, I was involved in most of that. Not, not heavily involved, just sort of on the sideline going, yes, that's, I understand what you mean. That was my involvement. Um, but during those holidays, and we have, uh, we have the Buddha's birthday, we have the Buddha's enlightenment, which was the first part of December, but the Buddha's birthday is in April, so the weather's very nice. We have the ceremony outside. And then Vulan, which is uh, 
Um, the Vietnamese, they, they call it Mother's Day, but it's also remembering people that have passed away. And so I have, we do about half the chanting is in Vietnamese, so you can sit there and go, what the hey, what, what, what did they say? And then the other half is in English, so the Vietnamese can sit there and go, huh, what, what? And so then I have always have one of the Vietnamese monks or nuns give a talk, and then, and then I give a talk in English, except that probably <clears throat> next year our, uh, our number two guy here, Rui Mung, I was thinking this morning about him, he'll probably be giving the talk because it's time to push him up to the front. And uh, he speaks very well. So I'm giving you lots of warning <laughs> about this. Yeah. And uh, he was down in Orange County for me yesterday taking care of a group down there. And he had a great time, which is good. And they invited him back next month, which is even better. So we were down in Ontario on Friday night at 9 o'clock. We had a ceremony. Unfortunately, I got sick. And I was going, where's Susan? Where's Susan? Can I? I overheated terribly. The room was packed with people, and they must have had at least a hundred candles, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, and I was just and just sweating, and starting to get ill, and thinking he's going to ask me to speak, which he always had, and he didn't. But I was all prepared to ask a simple question because it's New Year's. Have you forgiven your enemies for New Year's? In Buddhism, we have a few things we do. We're very similar to the Jewish people, which I think that we must have been friends 3,000 years ago because we believe you're supposed to clean your house. Okay? You're supposed to clean out the refrigerator of bad food. You're supposed to pay off any debt that you have. And you're supposed to make friends with your enemies, i.e., you're supposed to forgive people who have offended you. Okay? That's a pretty hard thing to do. That last one's pretty hard to do. So I was going to ask the Vietnamese people there, have you forgiven your enemies? There's a, a basic uh, reality or a basic truth that the Buddha recognized that this, the source of all of our problems in life is ourself. Now I know that a lot of people don't agree with that. They go, yes, but... A hurricane came through. My dad, who's gone now, but he lived in Dallas, and he was married to this wonderful lady who grew up a farm on a farm in West Texas, and she was deathly afraid of tornadoes. So she had him build a, a, a storm cellar. And I can remember her coming in and waking us up in the middle of the night and going, come on, come on. And it's raining outside. Now, we never had a tornado in Dallas. But I can't tell you how many nights I sat out there and the storm, trailer, the storm cellar would fill with water because we didn't have anything like a sump pump. You know, that wasn't part of the plan. So we had to sit up on these little benches and keep our feet out of the water. Um, and, and why did I even say that? Oh, I don't know. I just had a senior moment here. Um, Somebody help me. Forgiving your enemies and, and, huh? and how it's all, how we feel everything's all. Oh, everything's yeah, everything's us. us. Yeah, I don't know why I went off on that tangent. Because she was afraid But uh, remember I was sick Friday. <laughs> the brain got muddled. And I was going to ask everybody that. But... Oh, and she thought that tornadoes, were, you're saying everything, how we respond is really us, not yeah, outside yeah, forces. Yeah, everything, how we respond is us. So that if we get mad at what somebody says, it's us. Oh, tornadoes. Okay, I got it. Yeah. I got it. Okay, tornado comes through and knocks down your house. It's a traumatic, tumultuous event. Now, are you going to suffer? Don't assume you're going to suffer. The question is, do you choose to suffer? I, I, I grew up in California. I've been out of the state many times. I've gone to co other countries a couple of times. But I can tell you, growing up most of the time in California, that we have a couple canyons down on the coast that every winter houses slide down these canyons. 
And these people go and rebuild these houses in these canyons and then they get mudslides and once again their houses fall off the canyons. And I watch them in the news and they're going, oh, I lost my house, I lost everything I had. My swimming pool went down the other side and we went down this side. But one of the things that was very common is, and, and the newscaster said, what are you gonna do? I said, well, we're gonna rebuild. Right in the same spot. They didn't say something like, I think we'll go down where it's flat and we'll build a house that won't slide off into the ocean. So some of those people made a choice to be miserable and suffer. And I can't, honestly, I can't imagine that they had any insurance on those houses. What insurance company is going to, to insure a house that's, that's sitting on a mud hill that if it rains bad enough, it's just going to slide right down into the, into the canyon? So the question becomes, are you going to suffer about it? And we've had a lot of, the last two or three years, we've had a lot of natural catastrophes in this country. Tornadoes and rain and snow. And I was in New Orleans two weeks before Katrina. And devastating, absolutely devastating. What a horrible situation. People are still pointing the fingers. Why didn't they help? Why didn't he help? Why didn't, but you know what they're doing in New Orleans? They're just rebuilding. They think the dike is better now and that they'll survive this and that. So the question is not, or the, the statement should not be, of course we're going to suffer, we're going to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. The question is, how are you going to handle this situation? And the people in New Orleans, they don't want to move. I mean, that's a city that's got a history that's older than America almost. And so they're just rebuilding. So what are you going to do? You're in a car crash. I've been in two really spectacular car crashes as a passenger, and it was not the fault of the driver either time. The first time, a lady who had a bottle of whiskey between her knees mm -hmm. ran a red light and ran into us, estimated around 60, 65 miles an hour. When I got out of the car, three wheels were on the ground, one was up in the air, okay? And people, and it was my car, but I wasn't driving. <laughs> People go, oh, that's terrible. I go, no, it's not. I haven't got a bruise anywhere. I had my seatbelt on. Okay, yeah, and it hit, the car hit my door. And the door went flying over there and everything, but I was just all tucked in. I saw that car coming. There's nothing you can do. And that happened twice. And I got whiplash pretty good the second time. But the question was, well, isn't that horrible? No. What, you know what's really good is in the state of California, we're required to have insurance. I know. When I was young, I wasn't happy about that. I thought, why are you picking on me? I only make $1.50 an hour, and you're requiring me to have insurance. But both of those times, one was my car. The other was a monk that came here with me. His car was six months old. It was a little, um, little Ford uh, whatever. Mercury, whatever. A nice little car and just destroyed it. $23,000 worth of damage and the car cost him twenty seven, dollars and the insurance company fixed it because they saved like three, dollars $4,000. But uh, got clobbered by a lady in a giant Oldsmobile from the 70s. But unfortunately, she didn't have any insurance and she didn't have a driver's license. Mm. Just plowed right into the side of that car. T-boned it. And both instances, people would go, that's horrible. I go, well, but here I am. So, yeah, it's just a car. That's all it is. It's just a car, ultimately. And what if we didn't have insurance? It's still just a car. I mean, we could have been horribly hurt, uh, but we weren't. So there's always a choice in how happy we're going to be, you know? Um, and in here, there's a line, and I usually try to choose as the topic of the talk, one of the lines in here, because this, this was a poem in the beginning, and I got involved with it with a, a monk from Vietnam who was translating it, and it was almost unintelligible. He said, what do you think of this? And I went, 
okay, what is it? What are you trying to say here? Because if you've ever done any translating, you know the worst translation is one that comes directly out of a dictionary. And you almost can't tell what the point of what the person is saying is. And I've been in that spot. Some of the translating of ceremonies we do here starts with the dictionary and then it has to make the leap to what actually is trying to be said. So let me see if I can find the line in here. It's in the first few lines. And I thought I would talk about this a little bit. <laughs> or maybe I won't find it. Okay, so these were pretty much in stanzas, except some of them got a little long. And it says, Together without hatred, together without war, let those who commit wrongdoings believe in reincarnation and karma so that they may turn towards right action. Now, karma is an interesting thing. It's in every American dictionary that's been around for the last 30 years. We talk about it all the time. Cowboys incorporate it in their songs. What goes around comes around. That's karma. Okay. It's part of really the American culture now, this notion of karma. This is an interesting phrase because it sounds very Christian to me. So when I hit it, I'm not sure that I'm 100% happy with it because it says we hope people that do bad things believe in reincarnation and karma so that they will turn towards right action. And this really implies that uh, maybe they can get out of uh, uh, punishment, things like that. So I, I want to talk a little bit about karma. But first I have to say, and I repeat this over and over again, and I, I assume at some point people will hear it and understand. To practice Buddhism, to be a Buddhist, and some of these people are Buddhist in here, these guys here, those guys over there, you know they're Buddhists. They're wearing the funny clothes. Um, there's only one thing that you have to accept as a matter of faith. And uh, I belong to a number of, of groups, and uh, we were described as faith communities. And, and, uh, and it was uh, once again, it was that thing of, well, so when is the Jewish New Year? And they were trying to be as neutral as they could except they didn't understand that we weren't a faith community. Buddhism is not a faith community. There's only one, one article of faith, and that article of faith is that the historical Buddhist, that Arthur Gautama, who lived roughly 2,500 years ago, accomplished this thing called enlightenment. And the reason we call him Buddha, which means the enlightened one, is because everybody back in his time believed he was awakened. Now, they could have been wrong. You know, they could have just been, they could have been the woo-woo crowd of that time. And they went, oh, look at this guy. He's something else. He's talking good, like the way he talks. Now, this is, dif this is a difficult thing because historically, if we just look at America, we've had religious leaders over the years that were very charismatic, that created huge crowds. There's a, there's a church down in Orange County. I drove by it this year. And I said to someone, I said, what is that? And they said, well, that's a crystal cathedral. And I'd only heard about it. And I went, my God, that's huge. That's enormous. Okay. And he had thousands and thousands of people who went in there. Well, that fella, he passed away and now they're arguing. His, his son and somebody else is arguing. Son doesn't want it. And I don't know. You know, it's all, it sounds like politics. Sounds like Washington. But the thing was, he had to be charismatic. And I don't think I've ever heard him say a word. Maybe I did. I was changing the channels on the TV and he, he was standing there. But he had to be charismatic. You know, over in, in Victorville, um, we, we have a, a, what I call the Crystal Cathedral in the High Desert. And it's, I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's... Ah, it's by a junior high school over there. It's a very large church. And they have lots of uh, assistant pastors in it and everything like that. 
Whoever the guy, does anybody know what I'm talking about? The High Desert, the High Desert Church. Well, church is it, high, church is that it? Desert. The High Desert Church? Church of the High Desert. Church of the High Desert. Nice place. I've been there a few <coughs> times for meetings. And I, <laughs> never been there for a service, obviously. But <laughs> I know without a doubt that whoever the minister was that started that had to be charismatic. There's millions and millions of dollars in buildings there. So, as a little aside for you that don't know me, because we have a small group here that really don't know me, this is a sure indication that I'm not charismatic. <laughs> uh, because our, our temple here, this will go on the internet, our temple here is pretty humble. And so we go back, we know that the Buddha was charismatic. He was the only religious leader of, of, uh, of all the great starters of religions, you know, like Muhammad and Jesus and all of that. He was the only religious leader that in his time he had tens of thousands of followers. And we know this, and, and the historicity of what went on with him is so well documented. His ministry was 45 years instead of like three years with Jesus, or one year, however you want to interpret it. He was around for 45 years, and he was Indian, and that means he liked to talk. He liked to talk more than me. He must have just constantly talked. Sun was up, time to talk, you know. Sun goes down, time to meditate. So we know he was charismatic because he had all these followers. He had a huge impact on India and the surrounding countries as time went by. We know he was good looking because he was really Nepalese. We always say he was Indian, it was North India, that's Nepal, and the, and the people in Nepal are really good-looking, attractive people. Uh, when they talk about the Buddha, they talk about his skin had a kind of a golden hue. Well, that's what the people of Nepal look like. They have their dark skin, but they have a golden hue to them, a very attractive face. So he was a good-looking guy. We know that he was intelligent because the Pali Sutras are filled with hundreds of pages of people coming and wanting to argue with him about reality and rather than him going you know I'm the enlightened one you can either accept what I say or you can hit the road he never did that he talked to them very logically logic and used logic for the time 2500 years ago and tried to show them move them toward the way he saw things he never condemned anyone. He never encouraged his students to condemn people because they disagreed with him. He had one of his foundational teachings was that you cannot conquer hate with hate. Only with love can hate be conquered. So he was an incredible leader. But the only thing you have to accept about him and his teachings was that he was awakened. That's your article of faith. No way to prove it. I mean, I know, if we belonged to another religion, we'd say, well, look at this book, it says. But no, that isn't the way it works. We just have to, okay, this is, this is the product of his understanding. These are the students that came after him. This is his, we say in, in, um, in Buddhism, and we said it today, we take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge in the Dharma, which is his teachings. And in Dharma, it basically means law, but that means teachings. And we take refuge in the Sangha, which are the monks and nuns and the lay people that follow the teachings of the Buddha. So, all, all of that, 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 that's what he started rolling. And Buddhism is, one of the things is, Buddhism is the only religion that's never had a religious war. Doesn't mean we haven't had crazy people. Every religion's had crazy people. But we've never had a religious war where we went out and tried to conquer other countries and convince them because one of the foundational beliefs is ahimsa. And ahimsa is to do no harm. And how do you go conquer somebody by hitting them in the head and teaching them, well, you need to be nonviolent? <laughs> so it doesn't work. So it's a, it's a very unique teaching, but it's, it has nothing to do with faith. Because the Buddha on his deathbed said, anything I've said means nothing. 
if you don't prove it for yourself. Do not believe what I said because I said it. Do not believe what I said because you respect and love me. Believe what I said because you go out and prove it to be true. One of the great misunderstandings is the Buddha rejected the, what the Hindus believed. He never did. He said, we need to start over. So everything that you know is a religious belief you need to put a critical eye to. And if it, if it stands up to your criticism, then it's true. And if it doesn't stand up to your examination and criticisms, then you can discard it. So in Buddhism, we have a, just a, a, an interesting thing in that Buddhists very often belong to more than one religion because we're not mutually exclusive. We don't think anybody's wrong. And that's so hard for some people to understand. <laughs> but in the East, they understand it. I have a, a longtime friend who says, we don't understand why Americans only think they can follow one religion. Because in the Orient, very typically people, at least in Mahayana countries, they follow Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. And they take, they take pieces from each one of those things, and they don't see any conflict. So we come back to karma. Karma is the only thing that the Buddha essentially adopted from the Hindu belief. And it was pretty new at the time he adopted it. This was not a universal belief, but it was becoming a universal belief. And the Buddha adopted it, but he adopted it in a slightly different way. And he adopted the notion of reincarnation. And he talks about it if it's rea as if it's reality. Okay, I told you that the Buddha said you don't have to accept anything he said just because he said it. You don't have to, to be a Buddhist, you don't have to believe in karma. You don't have to believe in reincarnation. If, if it doesn't make any sense to you, that's fine. I do, but I've always been just a Buddhist. And to me, it sounds very logical. Now, there's no way to prove what happens after death, even though people have tried for thousands of years. There's absolutely no way to really prove to anybody what happens after death. So I accept reincarnation just because it, it, of all the different ideas people have. It, to me, it's the most appealing. Is that a good reason to accept something? Well, it's better than nothing. And I accept the idea of karma because we see karma in action in our daily life. We see people who are bad and eventually... Um, get caught, or bad things happen to them. But one of the notions of karma, and this, like, I'm, I'm not 100%, uh, I may change this little thing in here, you know, I hope people who do bad things will accept karma and reincarnation, because karma is not punishment, not the way the Buddha treated it. Karma is an education. Now, the Hindus think of it as punishment. And they say, well, you know, if a baby is born and they don't have any arms, well, that's punishment for what they did in their last life. That's not Buddhist. Okay? That's, that's not a Buddhist idea. Because that's punishment. And punishment, who's punishing? In order for there to be punishment, there has to be a consciousness that punishes. And we don't believe there's a consciousness in the universe that's going to take time to punish anyone. So people say, well, then, then what would happen? What, what is this whole karmic thing? Well, it's, it's lesson learning. If I, and, this, and I, this is extreme, but if I was a terrible person and I chopped the arms off of someone, and then, you know, I lived a happy life and I lived in a big house and I had a big car and I had lots of money and I had all kinds of women and I just had everything that a guy's supposed to have if he's successful. In my next life, it wouldn't matter what my station in life was when I was born, but I, when I had a child, my child would have no arms. And that's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. I'm, I'm watching a TV series now called Call the Midwife. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's marvelous. It's a British thing about the midwives in England in the 
50s and 60s. And the last two episodes had thalidomide babies in them. And if you don't remember thalidomide, it caused birth defects that were horrible. <clears throat> and I watched it last night, and there was a baby born without any arms. That's where this came from. So here you are in your, in your next life, and you have a child without any arms. And what do you learn from this? How are you going to deal with it? To me, that's what karma is. If you were successful, you learn to love the child. I used to have a National Geographic, and uh, I'm a retired high school teacher for those that don't know, and I used to use these pictures, which were horrible in one sense. Uh, there in Japan, on the coast, there was, a, there was a hat factory, felt hats. And in the making of felt hats, they used mercury. And they washed them with seawater. And the, the ocean around this village became contaminated. And the children were born with terrible birth defects. And the pictures in the National Geographic were pictures of these children now as adults and the mothers that took care of them. So the lesson learned, some people would say that happened to you because, it happened to the child because of karma. And then someone who was a little bit more skillful would say it happened to the parent because of karma. And what's the lesson to learn? Love. The Buddha really felt that love was the great divider. It was the thing that brought everything, or not divider, but brought everybody together. And the Buddha talked about <clears throat> metta. And metta is love that's non-controlling love. Metta is you can love somebody without having to try to own them. And so in this poem that we recited today, they talk about non-possessive love. Okay, so if you have a wife, can you love her without trying to possess her? Or a husband, can you love him without trying to possess him? Or a child, can you love the child without trying to constantly control them? So to me, karma becomes simply a lesson. That if you did something in this life that harmed other people, then somehow you would learn in the next life, or the next life, or the next life, whenever it was, you would learn the lesson of the effect that had. But not, not by having it happen to you. Because there's no lesson to learn in there. If you come down with cancer, what, what lesson do you think you're going to learn? If you uh, in a terrible accident and you lose your legs, what lesson do you think you're going to learn? You can rationalize it all to death, but when somebody near and dear to you does, that's completely different. Karma. And we're going to offer a little incense, and then please come have lunch with us.